Well, I'd like to build a little bit off of what we started to talk about last week. I want to build on that a little bit. Um, Last week we talked about sharing Jesus with other people. And that ultimately what we're sent out to do as messengers is not to declare a teaching or a philosophy, but ultimately we're declaring Jesus. That's what we're sharing. That's what we're inviting people uh, into. You know, our mission statement as a church is that we exist to help people discover Jesus, to trust Jesus, and to follow Jesus. So we're inviting people to discover Jesus, right? We, that's, who, that's, that's what we want them to do. We want them to come and explore who Jesus is and what he's come to do. And uh, the passage that we want to look at this morning uh, wrestles with this question about how can we know God? How can we know God? And of course, the answer, the key to it all, is Jesus. Again, he is the key. So um, that's the question we want to look at. How can we know God? It's very important for us to have a sense of what the answer to that question is because if we're sharing Jesus with people, we need to be able to share with them how they too can know God through Jesus. All right? So that's what I mean when I say that we're kind of building a little bit on last week's teaching. And uh, for centuries, centuries, human beings have been wrestling with this question question, is there a God? You know, is there some divine being out there? Is there some uh, supernatural being that we can connect with, that we can connect to? And if there is, uh, how do we connect with this divine being? How do we connect with God? Can we connect to it? I mean, that's really the basis of all conversations around spirituality, all conversations around religion for centuries and centuries and centuries. Is there a God? Can we connect with God? And every religion, of course, has a set of answers to those questions, including Christianity. But what we're going to see this morning is that the, the claims of the Christian gospel are unique amongst all the other religious claims of the world. They're, in, they're incredibly unique. So let's look at the passage. This is four verses. I'm sorry I don't have a handout um, for you this morning, and there's no PowerPoint, so we're going old school. Just, we're just reading right from the text. So if you have your Bibles, 1 John chapter 1, and I'm going to read four verses, the first four verses of this letter from the Apostle John to the Christian churches that he was... Uh, that he was involved with. Why don't we stand together as we read this word? 1 John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things to you so that you may fully share our joy. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you that John wrote these words. He wrote them for people that he himself had discipled, and had uh, been involved with and led as an elder in the church. And they have touched the lives of countless thousands and even millions over the centuries, and they are preserved for us today to read and to learn from. 
to know that Jesus is indeed your son. And so we ask that you would now speak to us through this word, through your servant, and that we would have ears to hear and hearts humble to obey. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. These, these verses are loaded with all kinds of things we could talk about. Um, I've, been, I've been reading again um, one of my favorite preachers, Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a preacher in, uh, in Britain, actually in London, at a church called Westminster, Westminster Chapel. Back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, he was there. And he, uh, a bunch of his sermons have been you know, transcripted and put into books. And he has one where he preached through the, the book of 1 John. And, uh, and I think he did, took like a year to do it. <laughs> and uh, of course, 1 John's only five chapters. And he preached, I don't know how many sermons, like a couple dozen sermons just out of these first four verses. So there is just a ton here. And we, we can only look at a little bit. But in this idea of uh, knowing God, there's, there's three things that, that we can uh, look at this morning. Three things John shows us is that God can be known, that God wants to be known, and then he also shows us how we can know him. That God can be known, that he wants to be known, and how we can know him. So let's look at that first one. God can be known. If we were to ask John the question, can God be known? Of course, he would answer an emphatic, yes, he can. Now, what's interesting is that there was a lot of, there's been a number of religious gurus and philosophers and teachers over the centuries who have said yes to this question, can God be known? They've said yes, but John's yes is a very different kind of, of yes. How is it different? Well, when, when a lot of other religious figures claim that it's possible for us to know God, they give us a, a set of rules to follow or a set of principles that you, that you have to pray or live out or some philosophical approach to, to God. So there's usually a list that accompanies it. You know, do these things, meditate on these principles, uh, you know, embrace this philosophical teaching and you'll have some kind of a spiritual awakening or breakthrough or, or some kind of divine connection. But it's very interesting that John, he doesn't give us any of those things. He doesn't, he doesn't give us those things. He doesn't give us rules. Although he does talk about God's commandments in the very next, in, in, in the very same, uh, sorry, the very next chapter, chapter two. He doesn't give us a philosophy, and he doesn't just give us some principle to meditate on. You know what he gives us? He gives us a person. From the very beginning, the very first thing John starts in about is a person. He says, you want to know it, that how I know that it's possible to know God? You want to know how I know it's possible to know about God? I've met him. I met him, John says. Look at how he starts off the letter. Look at that first verse. We proclaim to you, proclaim, not recommend. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard, whom we have seen. We saw him with our own eyes. We touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. Well, what had John heard? What's he talking about here? What had he seen? What had he touched? What does he mean? Well, he was talking about Jesus. Now, you say, well, you know, it doesn't, the name of Jesus is not mentioned in those first couple of verses. Yes, you're right, but there's a term here the word of life. We know from John's gospel that often he would call Jesus the word. The word of life. And that word is a, is a Greek word, log, the logos. Or the logos, depending on how you want to pronounce it. 
And that that Greek word was meaning the meaning behind everything, the reason behind everything. So when, when he, he's talking about Jesus that way, he's talking about that Jesus is the God who has been before the beginning. He's saying, I've met the one who was with God in the beginning. I've met the very reason behind everything, that I touched him. Now, it just tells us a couple really key important things about John. First of all, that he was an eyewitness of the things that Jesus said and did. He was what you would you call an apostle, one of the original, hand-picked, personally trained disciples of Jesus, who was with Jesus for the three or so years of Jesus' ministry, who saw the crucifixion, saw Jesus die, saw him executed, and also was there at the empty tomb on the Sunday morning. He saw the tomb empty, and he was also one of the people who personally met the resurrected Jesus. On on more than one occasion, he saw the resurrected Jesus. He was an eyewitness of of the things Jesus said, the things Jesus did, the the death and resurrection, but his knowledge of God was also um, therefore based on uh, real sensory experience. So let's look at those two things real quickly, this eyewitness testimony and also this idea of sensory experience. John heard Jesus preach. He saw and witnessed Jesus heal blind people, uh, heal crippled people. He witnessed personally Jesus raise people from the dead. A little girl, a little boy, Lazarus. He saw those things. He was an eyewitness to those things. And of course, he was an eyewitness to the two biggest moments of Jesus' life, his crucifixion and his resurrection. The reason John says, I've got authority to speak on these things, the reason he's writing is because he says, I have met God in the person of Jesus. I saw him, heard him, touched him. Now, this is really important, friends, because we need to understand the last people who would have believed that Jesus really was God, were first century Jewish people. The great blasphemy in Judaism is to say that God had become a person, that God was a person. They believed so strongly that because God was so other, he was so holy, he was so great, that he certainly would not have limited himself and, and lowered himself to become a person. So anybody who was claiming to be God, that was like the ultimate blasphemy. The ultimate blasphemy was to say that you were God. And of course, we see Jesus over and over and over again saying, not not always directly, but often in very indirect and actually very powerful word pictures, Jesus is constantly claiming to be God. He's constantly doing it. In fact, Jesus' claim to be God is the thing that got him killed. That's the thing that in the end, that's the thing that the nail in the coffin, the thing that seals the deal when he's finally before the religious teachers. And they said, are you the Messiah? And he says, I am. And I tell you the truth, that from now on you will see the Son of Man at the right hand of God. He says, from now on you're going to see me high and lifted up, equal with the Father. And it says the high priest tore his cloak and he said, that's it. That's it. What what more testimony do we need? He's a blasphemer. Kill him. Execute him. The only reason John and the other disciples believed Jesus really was God is because they saw all these things and they saw him risen from the dead. Their testimony, 
as much as it, it, it seems, you know, there's so many people over the years has try, have tried to say that, well, they hallucinated. You know, they got themselves so worked up. They were so, um, so overwhelmed in their sorrow and their grief, they just made up these stories. Friends, you can't make up stories like this. And you, you can't spread stories like this and get other people. These first century Jews would not have been able to get other first century Jews to believe them and follow them unless this really happened. There's so many things we could talk about about the reliability of their testimony, but they saw it. They, they were eyewitnesses. And this is what the apostolic teaching is based on, is that we're not just, we're not just pointing to something and believing in something, that it's like a set of principles, and here's, here's some ideas, here's some opinions, here's some advice about God, about how to connect with No, they said, we saw this. We were part of it. We, we heard it. We, we touched the risen Lord with our hands. Their testimony was based on eyewitness objective truth that they saw and experienced. And that kind of leads to this next part about sensory experience. John doesn't say, I've had a vision. He doesn't say, I had an out-of-body experience. Which is, tends to be what a lot of New Age teaching and things are about. It's about kind of visions, feelings, you know, out-of-body stuff. And of course, what's the, what's the problem with that? We can't substantiate any of that, right? It's, it's so subjective. But John, John doesn't start that way. He doesn't say, we had a vision. We had an experience, you know, out of body. He says, no. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we heard. We saw it. We touched him. In Jesus Christ, God becomes somebody to know. Somebody to touch. Somebody to be touched by. God had become visible. He became tangible. Got to become personally knowable. It is the unique claim of Christianity that Jesus, that in Jesus Christ, God became a person who now we have tangible access to, relational access to, in a very personal and very real way. And that is important, friends, as we're sharing the gospel with others, as we're introducing them to Jesus, that is the central claim we're claiming. We're not saying that Jesus is the teacher above all teachers to give us a religious advice or to talk to us about spiritual experience. We're, we're proclaiming that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh come down. That's the apostolic witness. That's the thing that John is proclaiming. And so that's got to be key. When, if you're ever talking to people about Jesus, it's, it's not conversations about rules. It's not conversations about, you know, just religious experience. It's conversations about a person in history who's entered in, whom the apostles saw, heard, touched, and it was real. So God can be known. That's John's first claim here as he's saying, we are proclaiming the one who can be known. The one who can be known. But he, he's also saying something else, and that is this, the second thing. God wants to be known. See, this is another big question within, you know, questions of philosophy. Can God be known? Does he even want to be known? Does he even care about us? You know, there's a, there's a lot of people out there. You, you've probably encountered them. I don't think you are one of them this morning because I think I know most of you and I know that, all, that all of you know Jesus in a personal way. But there's lots of people out there who will say, in our culture, who will say things like this, that, yeah, I believe there is a God out there, but I'm, I'm not sure we can know him. And if there is a God, he, he's, he's very distant and very removed from our world that he's kind of set things into motion, but he's just kind of stepped back and he's just letting things happen. And so maybe there is a God out there, but I'm not sure we can know him. Or there's just people maybe saying, yeah, I believe that there is a God out there, but I'm not sure how I can know him. 
I'm not convinced that any one of the major religions really has the truth, has the answer. And so everything's kind of vague and everything's kind of, well, maybe. The claim of the gospel, though, is completely unique and different because here's what it's saying. It's saying that, that God himself has revealed himself to us has revealed himself. He has taken the initiative. And this is what is so key, friends. It's so important and it's something that's unique to the gospel that you need to understand whenever you're talking to other people about your faith. And that is that in the Bible, we have a God's self-revelation. And really, think about it just logically for a second. How could we really say anything about God and know anything about God unless God has told us about himself? I mean, if we're dealing with God, you know, this, this divine being, certainly there's nothing possibly we could say for certain about him as human beings unless he has said something first to us. And that is absolutely what the Bible is claiming, that God has made himself known and has been doing it for generations and generations and that the, the author of Hebrews says, and now he has finally, perfectly, and clearly made himself known in his son, Jesus Christ. That the prophets for centuries have been speaking in what uh, the, the, the Greek word that the author of Hebrews uses is like basically speaking in pieces, speak, speaking in fragments. You know, that, and that each prophet, that, that's the great thing, is that as you read the prophets and as you read the law of Moses and everything, you get... The, the kind of full picture of God, because each of the prophets tend to emphasize certain characteristics of God. So they're kind of speaking in fragments, in pieces. And he says, but now, now he has spoken to us through his Son, in whom all the radiance and glory of God dwells. Now we get a personal revelation. If you want to know what God is like, God himself says, I have shown you in my son. And Jesus himself, Jesus himself claims, there's a, there's a moment when he's talking with his disciples in John, I think it's chapter 14, and he says, I, it's time for me to go. I'm going to be crucified and I'm, and I'm going to ascend to the Father. He says, but don't worry, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And Philip finally says, just show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. And Jesus says, Philip, don't you know me after I have been with you all this time? He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am perfectly making known to you and fully making known to you who the Father is. And it's not just that 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 Jesus is like God, but that God is like Jesus. If you want to know what God's like, you look at Jesus. See, that's what we're pointing to. That's the, the, the revelation of the Bible is saying God has revealed himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ. That we can know him in Jesus and through Jesus. He can be known. He wants to be known. He invites us to know him. And this is the amazing, unique claim of the Christian gospel. No one else is saying this. No, no other religion is claiming everything else is its advice, its ways to God. Jesus comes and says, I'm not giving you another way. I am the way. I am the one that, that everybody else has been trying to talk about. I am coming and I am showing you and revealing the Father to you. And friends, think about that for a second. I don't know about you, but I certainly would want my God to look exactly like Jesus. And that's the claim of Jesus, and it's the claim of Scripture, is that that is exactly the case. So the question is, of course, how can we know him? Can we know him the way that John knew Jesus? Well, the Bible's answer is yes and no. Because you see, we don't see and hear and touch Jesus the way John did. He, he had, a, he, he had a, a, a 
an experience with Jesus that was tangible in a different way than you and I have him. But here's the thing. The sensory experience that we can have of Jesus is every bit as real as the one that John had. And you know how we know it? We know it through the word of life. The gospel claim is that Jesus himself is the word and there's some, when, the, when the word is declared, when the proclamation of Jesus is made, the promise of scripture is that something that is j- just as real and as profoundly life-changing comes upon us, you know it's God. You can't not know it's God, that it's so profound that when the gospel comes upon us and converts us, because remember, that's the claim of the gospel. We don't convert to it. It converts us from the inside out. It, God's power comes upon us by the Spirit and starts to change us. We don't just kind of decide one day, I'm just going to be a Christian now. The Bible says everything up until that moment, the Holy Spirit's been drawing us close, has been drawing us in, has been working on us, has been preparing our hearts so that when the gospel's finally com- proclaimed, and, there's, and our hearts are in the right place, boom, the penny drops, and bang, something happens that's so profound and life-changing. And that, friends, is what we're proclaiming. That's what we're sharing. That's what we're inviting other people to hear. It's not come and hear about this new teaching. One thing that's kind of happened a little bit in the church, and I don't think it's, we meant it to happen, but it happened, was we became people so focused on living out the Sermon on the Mount. Living out Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you know? Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, you know? Um, don't lust, because it's just as bad as adultery. You know, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the peace. We became so focused on the teaching, we forgot about the teacher. We forgot about the one who's, the one, who's the, at the center of it all. The only way you can be pure in heart is if the one who is pure in heart has purified you and is in you. The only way you'll, you'll, you'll run after him and pursue righteousness and hunger and seek after righteousness is if the one who is righteous and pure is, is in you. The teaching of the gospel is the person of Jesus. Every, Paul's saying it, John's saying it, James is saying it, Peter's saying it. It's all about Jesus. Do you know that? Is that real to you? When you have conversations with other people ever about your faith, what is the focus? I was asking us this a little bit last week. What's the focus? What are you sharing? What are you pointing them to? One of the things I've committed myself to whenever I'm talking to people about about faith is that no matter where the conversation goes, I'm going to point them back to Jesus. Friends, there's lots of doubts and there's lots of questions. You may have them. You definitely, your friends and, and your family who don't know Jesus have them. And they're good questions. Some of them are questions about what seem to be things that contradict themselves and what the Bible says. Um, which when you look deep enough, it's really not contradicting, but surely on the surface I, I understand, and I've come to see why people have, have issues there, but whenever I'm talking to people, I'm always trying to say, listen, this all hinges on Jesus. It all hinges on him. And if he really is who he says he is, if he really is Savior and Lord, then everything turns on that, and everything else is peripheral. Everything else is off to the sides. It's about him, and that's exactly what John's saying here. We saw him, we touched him. The, the, the word of life is in us now and has changed us. Our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. He says, and that's what we want you to share in. And the moment you've got that, then your joy is going to be complete. Then your joy will be full. So how can we know him? Well, you need to understand, of course, who Jesus is. And what he's come to do. Back in the very first part of John's gospel, he says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Eugene Peterson's translation in the message says, 
God moved into the neighborhood. God moved into the neighborhood, and we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. You've got to see his glory. There's, there's a, the word here in, uh, in these first couple of verses, it doesn't come through, the contrast doesn't come through so clear in this translation, New Living Translation, but it talks about, says, we saw him with our own eyes and we touched him. And it says, this is the one who is life itself, um, was revealed to us, and we have seen him. Now that word in the Greek means, that seen means to gaze upon. It doesn't mean like just to look, just to kind of see, but to gaze upon. To, to, to wonder and to contemplate in your own heart the, the reality of who this person is. You've got, you've got to look and see that Jesus, he's more than a teacher. He's the Lord. He's the Lord God himself come down to give himself for us. And so that's the, what the Jesus has done part. Our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. Now, good question. Why does he put it like that? Why does John say our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son? Because Jesus is not only, not only God, but he's the, the way we know God. He's the reason we can know God. You can't simply gaze upon Jesus, who Jesus is. You can't simply gaze upon the glory. The Bible says that'll kill you. You can't just gaze upon the glory. You've got to you've got to gaze at what it costs Jesus to give you fellowship with God. Friends, what happened on the cross? When Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What's going on? For the first time in his life, Jesus cries out for God and there's no answer. There's no answer there. There's no one on the other end of the line, so to speak. Jesus is cut off. He, he's experiencing a, a type of relational separation. The fellowship, the intimacy that we so long for and that Jesus had in that moment, he's, he's crying out because it's lost. Jesus Christ on the cross lost that intimacy with the Father so that you and I could have it. And that's how we know. That's how we know we can know him. Because Jesus says, I will come into that place where you are of being cut off. I will be cut off in order to, to reconnect the line, to make it open again so that you can have that intimate relationship with the Father. I'll get swallowed up into the darkness so that you can know the Father and you will know me. You do not come to know God by, by taking up a search to find him. Ultimately, he finds you. He comes after you. In Jesus Christ, God got up, clo- up close and personal with people. He moved into the neighborhood. And up in this morning, friends, he's getting up close and personal with you. By the power of his spirit, he's saying, do you know me? Do you want to know me more? I'm drawing you in. I'm calling you close. That's what we're about as a church. Did Jesus teach some things? Of course he taught things. Are those important? Absolutely. But you'll never appreciate them, you'll never understand them, and you'll never embrace them if you don't know him. And none of your friends or family will either. You'll never, once you know him, you'll want to keep his commands. Not because you have to, but because you, out of love you just want to serve him. And you recognize that he truly has your best interest in mind and that he's trying to protect you and that these things he's, he's given us, this teaching he's given us to live out, is the truth and it's the best thing we could possibly have. But at the center of it all is an intimate knowledge of him that shows itself in a loving obedience and delight in the things that God commands and loves. Do you know him like that? Are you pressing into him like that? Are you gazing upon him like that? 
to see what it cost him to bring you in. It cost him everything. But in love, he says, I'll do it. I'll go to hell and back to bring them in to heaven. Let's pray. Father, we, we say thank you. Thank you for giving us this passage. Thank you that we've got this word from you, from the Apostle John, your servant John, who was there with Jesus, who saw it all. And thank you that we can trust his testimony. Thank you, God, that his testimony, when it's proclaimed in your word and, and spoken like it has been this morning, it has the power to change us from the inside out. Thank you, Jesus, that you have opened the way of fellowship with the Father. May we, may we embrace that today. May we get up close and personal with you, knowing that you're drawing us in. And when we're sharing with you, sharing you with others, may we make sure that we're sharing you, the person of your Son, Jesus Christ, and calling people to look at him, to gaze upon him, to wonder at him, and to fall in love with him. And we know that by your Holy Spirit, that's what you help us to do, to fall more in love with you, and that when you're lifted up, you will draw all other people to yourself. So help us to do that in conversations with others from our work, in our family, our friends, our, co- our, our, our neighbors. May we proclaim Jesus and him crucified and raised from the dead. We thank you in his precious name. Amen.